Our speaker is uh, Ben Klimkowski, and he is presenting uh, Using Bro to Hunt Persistent Threats. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm going to try to speak quickly. I understand it's uh, the first brief, so bear with me. All right, so uh, well, I'm going to go through some background, some theory uh, about persistent threats, and specifically we're going to talk a lot about Cobalt Strike, which is a popular penetration testing tool. Uh, then we're going to go through the process of how we used Bro to analyze traffic to detect it, and then we, how we used or instrumented Bro to use it in a live setting. Uh, and then finally, we're going to go through some lessons learned and insights and try to extrapolate this out to persistent threats in general. I'd like you to walk away about how Bro could be used uh, to support every part of this enterprise, how tricky and difficult it is to look for persistent threats, how it can fit in a live setting and as part of a greater defense in depth strategy. And then finally, we developed some useful scripts and tools that we think are pretty cool, and we'd like to share that with you. All right, some mandatory disclaimers. Uh, these views are not the views of the Department of Defense of the United States Army. And in fact, I will probably use doctrinal terms imprecisely and irritate my boss through the course of this briefing. Uh, furthermore, educators, particularly ones that do computer security, uh, have strong opinions about defensive exercises. This is not to talk about the merits of CTFs, uh, attack defend, pure defense, or otherwise. And then finally, this is not an indictment or endorsement of Cobalt Strike. Um, Cobalt Strike is actually an excellent tool that I have a lot of respect for. And if wielded properly, it is extremely difficult to detect. Ed Scotus of CounterHack and Sans Notoriety came to speak to our students. And he has said that students, or correction, that teams that competed in attack defense CTFs that used Cobalt Strike tended to do better. So it's a pretty powerful tool. And even though we're going to talk a lot cobalt, about Cobalt Strike, just as Patches of Houlihan says, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball, right? So the things that you will learn from this, you'll be able to apply in other settings. I am one part of a much larger research team. We have three very special undergraduates that were at the top of their program and have done a number of internships with three-letter agencies and national laboratories, competitive cyber competitions, um, and various other training activities. And the senior advisor was Professor and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Petullo. The thing to take away on this slide is that I've been doing IT security for about eight years now, uh, both professionally and academically, but I've only been a bro user for about a year. So everything that you see in this briefing, everything that you hear is being filtered through the lens of somebody that's relatively new to bro but has some operational experience. Um, I'm interested in traffic analysis in general. The most important part of me is right here, and then there's some proof that I'm not a total robot. <laughs> so there's a lot of definitions out there when you talk about persistent threats, you talk about hunting. Uh, here are my definitions for the purpose of this brief and for the purpose of this research. A persistent threat is a threat that has the skill set to evade open source and commercially available tools because they have the resources to buy them and test against it. Uh, they have a lot of high trade craft, and they're in it for the long fight. They conduct long-term campaigns. They have the intel and the patience to do um, very sophisticated and accurate spear phishing campaigns to get that initial access if the network is that hard. Um, what all this means is that you may not see initial access vectors through the network traffic. If they need to, they will pay an insider to subvert the physical security of the system. They may even infiltrate the supply chain. Uh, it's also worth noting that this is not necessarily a nation state or Mandiant's APT1 we talk about a persistent threat. It's just any individual or group of actors that have the aforementioned characteristics. When we talk about hunting, we use a definition here that's very close to the one that CrowdStrike used at, uh, during a presentation at BroCon two years ago, and that is uh, you know, one that is a proactive uh, approach to identifying threats on the network, and it's all about using data analysis to whittle away things that are normal and identifying things that are indicative of anomalous activity, right? And you do this with both host-based and network-based logs, and it may or not be done in conjunction with incident response. 
So our specific use case, our motivating uh, background motivation is the cyber defense exercise, which is an annual competition put on by the National Security Agency in which all the service academies from the United States and Canada fight in blue teams where they build, operate, and maintain and defend a network against an actual adversary, which is the NSA red team, the actual real NSA red team. Uh, there are a number of components to this competition, but the main part is this three and a half day exercise where um, they're actually on a network and they're being attacked actively. Uh, and they're being scored on confidentiality, integrity, and availability points via an automated token or flag system that's looking at specific files on their workstations. Uh, and the red team is supposed to simulate a persistent actor. So they're not going to use any O-days or any secret tools that aren't available to the rest of the world. But they don't really need to because about a week prior to the competition, the students are given four very dirty images that are loaded with malware and have very bad security policies, right? So four images of different operating systems. And they have a limited amount of time to clean all the malware out and a limited amount of time to harden them. And say they even do a perfect job of eliminating all the malware and hardening their systems, the red team's got the ability to go over to the organizers of the exercise, the white cell, and tell them that, hey, we need access, and so they will initiate client-side exploits. So, I mean, your policies have to be absolutely perfect to prevent access. And so, essentially, the NSA is going to get, the red team is going to get access at some point during this exercise. Uh, and additionally, in this scenario, the defenders are at the SOC level, or what we call in the Army the NOSC level, Network Operations Security Center level. And so, what this means is that they are an echelon removed from the actual user. They may be separated by a geographic distance. And the effect of it is, is that we can't do any touch maintenance. We can't actually walk over to those workstations during the exercise and do host-based forensics using native tools or tools that we installed on it. We have to do it all via the network. So what you see here is something, uh, a typical attack cycle for a persistent threat. This is sometimes called the kill chain. And specifically, the part that we're looking at is this maintain access portion right here. Um, so our problem is given a persistent threat that already has some level of access and the ability, to, and we do not have the ability to actually touch or interact with our workstations, how do we detect C2 and data exfil that's deliberately designed to be a stealthy in normal protocols? So here was our approach. First, we want to understand the human dimension and how the actual actors use their tools in the context of a campaign. Then we'll actually generate malware samples and analyze it from normal. Uh, and then we'll just implement the detection techniques, evaluate, and refine. OK, so uh, Cobalt Strike is the tool that the NSA uh, typically uh, prefers to use. I have the same trouble explaining Cobalt Strike to people that are not familiar with it with it uh, as I do explaining bro to people that are familiar with bro, right? They want to like categorize it as just one thing. Oh, bro's kind of like snort, right? Uh, no, it's, it's a lot more, right? And Cobalt Strike is more than just a front end to Metasploit. What it really allows you to do is enterprise level hacking. And by that I mean uh, you can operate with a team in a pretty distributed architecture. And I'll show some slides that illustrate this in a second. It's got a sophisticated communication method via normal protocols or with the typical protocols that would be allowed on your network to interact with implants that it has on its machines. Uh, there's something that's worth mentioning called a stager, which after you identify a vulnerability on a system, you may have a limited amount of memory. So the, the attackers will throw a stager at the uh, target get that initial access and then the stager will download a much larger file, typically a beacon and then that beacon will use DNS, HTTP, HTTPS to communicate back home. Uh, the stager and the beacons both use those protocols, I should mention. Uh, it's also worth noting that the beacon can be set to call back either interactively or instantaneously, or it can be from second to days, depending on how low and slow you want to go. All right, so this slide illustrates the, uh, the network from the perspective of the attacker. So in this blue space here, what we see is the, uh, the target network. This gray space is essentially all the machines between you and the target, and then it's the team internal infrastructure. These angry looking red faced laptops, these are the actual operators, and the operators 
had the ability to share sessions via this C2 server right here. So they'll actually send their commands and connect to sessions via some centralized server. Out here in the gray space, these sad faces are proxies that they have the ability to acquire. Whether they bought them, they compromised them, they recruited them, it's now part of their infrastructure and it provides a buffer between them and the actual target network. And they'll set listening posts up from the victim to uh, these actual servers that they co-opted out here in gray space. And then finally what we see here is via these crabs, these little malware implants that are on one of our workstations, right? So say I want to interact with the target, I form my message, I send it to the C2 server. From the C2 server, it will then eventually go to one of the listening posts and it's now staged. The implant will make a GET request to this and an or encrypted, not encoded, but encrypted payload will go back to the implant. And from there, the implant will execute this instruction and then do a POST request with the information encrypted. And this will then eventually filter back through the attacker. Now say the beacon does a GET request, but there's no information or no instructions to execute, it will get a SLEEP command. And so this is typically how HTTP and HTTPS works. Of course, HTTPS is encrypted after the handshake. Uh, they also have the ability to do this via DNS. And DNS offers them some interesting characteristics. It provides a layer of concealment. Uh, what you'll notice here is that Cobalt Strike will use these nonce domains to ensure that nothing gets cached. And so what happens is that our malware implant will form a DNS query. This will go to the first uh, DNS server in the hierarchy. And then from there, that DNS server will do either an iterative recursive lookup. Here you see it's recursive. And it will go to its upstream provider for DNS all the way to when it finally gets to the authoritative name server, which is actually a listening post. Uh, from there, the C2 server and listening post will provide answers back via the answers or commands back via the answer section of the DNS response. Um, and this is very hard to defend against, right? Because with the HTTP and HTTPS, we can block it at the IP level. Here, you don't have to only black hole the domain, but you also have to coordinate with the upstream provider. So that increases your time cycle, you know, uh, your reaction time. Uh, additionally, you can have multiple registrations for a domain name. So it provides them some flexibility. Uh, so ideally we want to uh, develop artifacts and techniques in the network traffic that the attacker has a hard time to manipulate to evade detection, right? We want to make it impossible or ideal, you know, if we can't do that, too, uh, too expensive for them to change. Uh, so we derive these interesting artifacts that you see here. These are the results from looking at malware-only samples of packet captures, from looking at known good and known not cobalt strike traffic, and then actually production information from the 2016 CDX. Um, uh, we used Wireshark in addition uh, to some custom scripts heavily, but Bro is primarily the thing that we used. And so now I'm going to actually show you some of that Bro analysis. It's also worth mentioning that entropy was initially something that had some success, but then we had to take it out because we realized we we're getting too many false positives. We'll revisit this later. All right, so we developed uh, a, a script called BroFreak because we did, so much of simple, we did so much simple outlier analysis that we decided that we're going to make this part of everything that we do when we initially look at a packet capture. And so essentially what it does is it takes in a bro log and treats every entry as categorical data and will display the frequency and the number of st standard deviations uh, that that frequency is away from the mean frequency for all those entries within a particular bro column. And then it does that for every log across all the columns, and then you can interact with the resulting uh, output in a similar type syntax experience that you do with BroCut. Uh, the isolated PCAP sample you see here was taken from the 2016 data set. We knew we were compromised within a certain time frame, but we didn't know exactly what was going on, so we separated out uh, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS over a four hour window around the time that this happened. Um, and then we, we started analyzing the results here. All right, so this is the output from BroFreak. I understand this is hard to read, so we're going to blow into, uh, or we're going to drill into this a little bit. 
Now, I should mention that this was one IP that we took the samples from, and this is a Windows 10 box. And if you look at this, we see a ton of traffic um, compared to the other user agent strings that this host was using over this time period. And that may in itself not be nefarious, but then you start to look at, this is a Windows 10 box. You know, we didn't have Fatma's analysis, we didn't have her tools that she talked about yesterday, but we're smart enough to realize that, hey, this is a legacy browser on a Windows 10 box. Let's start looking closer, to, uh, closer at it. So we look at all the distinct hosts that that one individual Windows 10 box went out in that four hour window. It was over 15,000. Um, so then we actually looked at that user agent string and then you find out that only one domain is associated with this user agent string and the red team uh, left a nice little breadcrumb for us, right? We're gonna see this a few times where they almost become smart Alex and they, they give us a dead giveaway that hey, this is worth uh, drilling into. Okay, um, so then we developed another technique from there. So okay, now we're gonna look more closely at all the traffic here. And we're gonna look at specifically at comparing posts and get requests. So the intuition is, is that when you interact with a website, typically there's some amount of symmetry between how many get requests you do and how many post requests you do. But beacons don't behave like normal users. They phone home periodically until there's something to execute. So depending on how long the malware is on that machine, you may see a, a long series of get requests before it finally gets a C2 instruction to start actually pushing out post requests. And so sure enough, the ratio of get to post requests compared to the other host that we've seen here is orders of magnitudes larger, right? We set a threshold in our bro scripts of about 30. Um, so it's, it's worth noting when you talk about, we didn't instrument user agent strings because that's easy enough for an attacker to manipulate, but it's not so easy for an attacker to manipulate the get to post ratio. Uh, to go slower and send less get requests would slow down their operations. Uh, to send more post requests that essentially do nothing periodically increases their visibility and network logs. So either one of these things to change to kind of counteract our, our, our reaction doesn't really pay, uh, you know, cost them something, doesn't really pay off. We also created a custom parser for a DNS log uh, to understand our DNS structure uh, better. Uh, it takes in a list of frequencies uh, or domain names to their frequencies and stores it into a search try, also sometimes pronounced tree, stands for retrieval, so a quick data structures review. Uh, a try is a data structure based on key space decomposition. And here what we do is we break a domain name into subdomains, and then starting out at the root of the tree, going to that first node, we're putting in that top level domain. And then from that child node to the grandchild, we put in the se effective second level domain name. And we do that until we put in the entire fully qualified domain name, and we're keeping track at each node how many times that subdomain was seen. And this helps us do analysis. We have various outputs to understand and visualize this from a textual based output to a tree based output. And let me show you the results. So let's go ahead and look at uh, our domains going three levels deep and then limiting it to a threshold that they must have at least 50 child domains. Okay, so I'm going to blow this up again in a second here, but what we find out is when we look at this is we have a tremendous amount of child domains and that in itself is not so nefarious, but what is anomalous is the fact that if you look at the number of child domains and then you look at the total number of instances of DNS queries, they're the same, right? So that child domain was used exactly once. Now you would expect to see, you know, www.google.com a million times, but you would expect to only see a few children domain. You wouldn't expect to see this, you know, a million children domain hanging off of www.google.com. So that's worth uh, further analysis. So we search on part of the uh, domain name. We see a bunch of more interesting hits. Now we change the threshold here to, to include all instances of domain names, not just the ones that have 50 children. Parse this out to something more usable. And I'll pause a second here for you guys to read through this. You will notice that some of the uh, second effective level domain names here are from pop culture. Some of, them, some of the references aren't uh, necessarily politically correct. Uh, 
And so then so we start doing some more analysis, right? It doesn't seem legit. So here's what the tree-based analysis looks like on just innocent traffic. And so there was over 250,000 instances of uh, dot-com queries. So there was about 10 million or so total queries, DNS queries, throughout the 2016 data, uh, data set. From that, there's about 850,000 distinct domain names. Uh, what we'll see here underneath .com, we see USMA. There was 12 instances of queries to the USMA domain, and then there was 12 uh, queries to www, and the, there was no subdomains underneath that. Now, this is a parsed or a grepped view going four levels deep of matching on our uh, second level effective domain name that we knew was malicious or knew was anomalous, and we're looking at all these children domain, so we're matching the first five matches after it and two matches above it. And what we find out is that they all have a very similar nonce-like machine-generated subdomain. And that's from the malware. So this is something that we uh, definitely instrumented to look at. All right, so uh, here's how we evaluate in a live setting. Well, first you have to understand this is part of a larger defense in depth strategy. Uh, we had an elk stack. We uh, were we ingesting everything to include our service logs uh, in addition to firewall logs and snort. We had, uh, like I mentioned, a snort IDS. We also had a squid proxy, which actually limited the effectiveness of some of their HTTP and HTTPS beacons. Uh, and then finally, we were very limited on what we could actually put on the endpoints. But we did have one homegrown tool on one of the Windows boxes, and that's important to mention when you're trying to figure out how effective you are, because that did actually help us in some way. We initially ran it co-located with the Elk stack, but we realized that that was a resource hog. And then so mid-competition, we moved it over to the same server as the Snort. And although I don't have any statistics on me with that, I will tell you that we didn't have any dropped packets when we periodically monitored it. Right? So it is possible to do this at least 10 uh, gigabit Ethernet speed. All right, so this is not a scientific evaluation because we can't isolate our experimental variables in a controlled way. We obviously had a lot of things going on here. But anecdotally, I will tell you this is very powerful. So what you see in the 2016 data set or the exercise, there were this many uh, token events, and there's roughly about 10 to 100 token events per compromise. And so a dramatic reduction in the overall amount of compromises we had. Uh, we had the highest live competition score where you know, we particularly did well in confidentiality and integrity uh, points, uh, and we did much better than the other uh, uh, competitors. Again, I mentioned we didn't actually see a lot of uh, bro logs that we generated for HTTP and HTTPS. That's due to a few reasons, right? I mentioned the proxy. We know when the red team wants to exfil a little bit of information that DNS is their preferred route. They only use HTTP to do big file downloads. Uh, additionally, we ran into some issues doing querying uh, with our ELK stack, right? And we made a deliberate decision for our stateful detection techniques to use that via Kibana versus trying to do that in the bro uh, scripts because we were worried that the bro scripts would have too much overhead. And so after the competition, we decided to do some evaluation. So on a modest machine here, we wanted to look at samples now from both, from both data sets. Both data sets are about 500 gigs. Let's go ahead and see actually how expensive it is to do both stateful and stateless simultaneously on bro. So what you see here is a, co a comparison of the two different scripts, one with respect to uh, uh, time. I'll show, show RAM in a second. But the big takeaway here is not necessarily how much time it takes to run the script, but the relative distance, uh, difference between the stateless and the stateful. And you see here it's almost negligible. Same thing when you look at max RAM usage, with the exception of this one anomaly up here, it's almost imperceptible. At the request of the reviewers, uh, we uh, looked at DNSCAT and other ways to use common protocols to exfil data. DNSCAT is a way for attackers to pull information from a target using encrypted DNS text messages. So the actual text portion is encrypted with real encryption, right? You can't just uh, decode it. Uh, it was much easier to detect, and in fact, it almost immediately fills up the weird.log. Uh, just because of how long the domains are, right? It's, something's not parsing properly. Uh, but it does fire on some of our, our existing signatures or existing scripts. And if you actually change some of the techniques we use for callbot strike, 
you get um, some pretty, uh, pretty accurate answers very quickly. And although we didn't instrument it, because the domain names that are encrypted are so long, we feel that the entropy uh, techniques that are built into the latest versions of Bro would be very effective in this setting. All right, so there's a trade-off when you're we're talking about from the attacker. When they're trying to pull information from your network and they're stuffing it into normal protocols, the more information that they try to put in the message, the more obvious they're going to be. And so someone could, uh, from the red team can look at this briefing and say, well, I'm going to recompile my tool instead of using all 32 bits of the IPv4 uh, field in my answer section to send C2 instructions back via DNS, and I'm jumping all over the uh, IPv4 space range, I'm just going to use the last two octets. And that's true, but that means now within the same time window, if they have a time limit, they have to send twice as much traffic. Because now you've limited the amount of symbols you can send per message. Uh, furthermore, even if they were able to change that, the fact remains that there's this asymmetry between the beacons and the actual C2 interaction. And understanding that, when you compare it to normal protocol behavior, it will seem anomalous. We, I, you know, unfortunately, we didn't see too much HTTPS traffic. And after that initial handshake, there's not much that you can do. Uh, the, the real thing to look out for here is the certificates and track certificates in particular the default certificate in COBOL Strike is a self-signed cert. So that's a dead giveaway. Uh, we talked a lot about understanding normal. We talked a bit about defense in depth. One of the things that we uh, didn't really hit upon, though, is this idea that if you can be more dynamic on your network and change things rapidly, you need to. If you set an imp beacon to phone home once every 10 days, by the time the information gets back to the attacker and they store another C2 instruction, that may be enough time to change something on your network such that the resulting action from that infected client will seem anomalous. So very similar to the talks that we uh, saw yesterday when they were doing scanning on darknet IPs. If you could reconfigure IP space or change something on your default image or restructure your network in such a way you might be able to actually take advantage of the fact that the information has changed uh, and the fact that an attacker going low and slow will now not be able to see that. All right, so some things that we didn't get a chance to do. We didn't actually use any database connections well, when we were um, running our scripts. Everything was live. So if you wanted to do this over multiple files or getting files from many customers, you'd want to have this option so that you can keep everything uh, keep track of the state of all these different connections appropriately based off the way we instrumented this. Also looking at different ways to characterize machine generated domain names is important. This has been a known way to detect malware uh, at different echelons for a period of time. Uh, we're very much interested in looking at lateral movement next and how we can use Bro to do that. Um, we would like to see more benchmarking type studies that tell you when it makes sense to use things in like a distributed file system framework and do things at a big scale and when it makes more sense to do things at a smaller scale. Uh, and then finally with respect to the actual Bro framework itself, you know, at the time of when we were doing this research, self-signed certs did not show up in any of the logs, right? So there's a few things we can do with certificate anomalies that would help defenders initially. And then as we do more advanced things, with the bro scripting language. It makes sense to have sorted sets, sorted dictionaries, or sorted maps so that you can do more advanced operations efficiently in your code. All right, so one last time. This is our uh, repo. And subject to your questions, this concludes my brief. Questions? Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, social engineering on one of your early slides. Was that um, a significant significant part of this exercise? And second part of the question is, have you thought about using Bro to try and detect uh, early stages of a kill chain activity? Uh, so some of the things that we've, so to answer your question, it was a significant amount of activity. We're guessing at this point because the red team doesn't give us a complete play-by-play -play of what happened. But in some instances, and definitely in 2016, and we think even in 2017, 
that we cleaned up some of the images so well that they actually had to uh, manually go to a website or through some sort of web browsing with the white cell to download a fresh beacon. And so some of the things that hit weren't necessarily through the beacon doing C2, it was actually the stager that pulls the beacon down. But we were able to get in front of it. So it is a significant um, a thing to consider. And then the second part of your question, I don't think I, I answered, what was that again? Um, so, be, uh, so the, did we use Bro to look at social engineering in general? Uh, no, we didn't, other than the analysis that we're doing through these protocols. Um, it would take me a second to figure out exactly smarter ways of doing it. I mean, it's tough, right? I mean, that's what makes client-side attacks so effective. It makes the way it's so hard to look for. Um, technical question about one of your slides. So one of your slides you showed you were doing uh, browser frequency analysis and uh, the output um, was being piped into Unique and then the WC uh, to count the number of unique browsers. Uh, but you didn't pass it through sort. And I'm wondering if there was a reason for that or just an oversight. Yeah, right there. So the output goes from BroCut into Unique so is there a reason why it's not passed through sort? Because if unique by default will only... No, that's, that's a true statement. This is a copy and paste error. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, were rec we recreated parts of this analysis um, uh, for this presentation, and that's just, that's just a uh, typo. Okay. Yeah. And, and actually, to be, to be candid, some of this was actually the output of scripts that were homegrown, and we redid it this via command line tools because we thought it would be a little bit clearer as well when describing this to an audience that doesn't have insight to the script that we wrote. Um, so I'll qualify with, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't really had much experience with this red team, blue team stuff, but I have been in environments that um, did a fairly decent job of controlling access to um, baseline services like DNS and whatnot. And my question is, do you feel that there would have been any impact to the effectiveness of the red team if the the blue zone area was contained to just trusted DNS query sources. Right. Um, so I mean, this is an exercisism, right? Yeah. The when when you get to, I'm going to pull up the slide. There we go. Uh, this should both. This is supposed to be trusted, but they're not doing a good job. You know to keep the exercise moving. And the reality is that if you're seeing a, a, that your upstream provider is not doing a sufficient job uh, from their end, you would have to go through a more, uh, you know, you'd have to think of an alternate solution. Obviously, you could do, you know, the lookup to the more trusted uh, servers yourself and implement DNSSEC. Um, but the, there's still the ability for the attacker to register the domain names. So it's, it is a kind of a constant uh, cat and mouse game when you're chasing them. You're never going to fully escape it. Other questions? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you had uh, uh, one slide where you're showing the ratio of uh, get to post requests. Um, and it seemed like you were looking for cases where the, uh, the number of gets were significantly higher or the ratio was significantly higher than the number of posts. I, I was just thinking in a normal environment where you have users browsing around, isn't that going to be the, the normal case um, if they're looking at static content? Um, is, do, I, I'm just kind of wondering about the, the normal traffic that you see in the background of this exercise and, and how closely it reflects, uh, say, an enterprise environment? So, all of us, it's a great, it's a great question. All of us actually did network captures of our normal browsing profiles uh, to see how this would uh, the scale uh, to like real traffic that wasn't just traffic generated. Uh, there are some instances where there, there is a high ratio of gets to post, uh, and so that's why we set that threshold manually tuned about 30. There's also certain types of websites 
that you have to whitelist. And so inside our scripts, we actually whitelisted certain trusted hosts that we knew were going to be an issue to whittle down those false positives of wealth. Um, I didn't talk too much about false positives, but when if we go to some of these detection techniques, like so uh, content delivery networks, CDNs, generate a lot of false positives for the domain names, right? So we would whitelist those as well. And there's space in the scripts to do that. So you're not going to get something that's perfect, but for typical client-server interaction, these tend to do well. Other questions? All right, so uh, if there's nothing else, again, this is our repo. Please check it out. If you have any issues, please post them there, and we'll try to adjudicate them in a timely manner. And thank you for your time. Sir. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your time.